there was a uh, fairly good discussion on sustainable design of these things this is not quite um, on sustainable design however it is on um, life cycle cost or life cycle analysis so that's what this is and this is coming directly from this reference um but i i felt it is important to discuss this considering the overall focus towards uh sustainability and others so what is the whole uh, what is the basis of this study is that uh, when you design a heat sink typically uh one takes into account uh okay there is no fan that means that heat sink is uh is more energy efficient uh when there is no fan people tend to think that it is more energy efficient and uh, in our country most of the power comes from a coal based power plant when you put a fan um what happens is you consume certain amount of power and so we think that that energy consumption is uh higher that means when you have a natural convectively natural convectively cooled heat sink uh we think there is no fan so we are being very energy efficient however when you take into account the whole process by which the heat sink is made then you find that very surprising results comes up for example uh what i mean by that uh heat sink uh whole process meaning that when you make a heat sink let's call let's take an example of a aluminum heat sink an aluminum heat sink now starts from a ore and some aluminum ore and it needs to be extracted so there is certain amount of energy being used by that process then that ore gets casted into an ingot that consumes certain amount of energy on top of it then the ingot gets fabricated into a heat sink which which could be extrusion process which could be any process uh die casting this that all these processes manufacturing processes consume certain amount of energy so if you type the amount of energy consumption for making a fan and not including fan inefficiency or whatever this is the overall fabrication energy consumption and operational energy consumption that is fan energy so 85 m m is uh, mass of the heat sink w sub t is the energy used for cooling so this is the amount of mass this expression is a empirical expression and v is the volume flow rate of air or the fan power in kilowatt hour volume flow rate of air times pressure drop is the fan power uh n times t1 is the lifetime of the device in hours if you if you use this as an expression this 85 comes from the idea that for example japanese aluminum industry says that for you for for some aluminum heat sink to be made uh into a form assembled and transported it consumes about 85 kilowatt hour per kilogram so 85 kilowatt hour per kilogram times the mass gives the energy consumed during the fabrication process then the second part is the power consumed during operational needs that's the overall energy if you don't have the fan then all you have is this this term you don't when you don't have a fan in the system when it is natural convection cooled all you have is this term so let's see what this means so then with this we can write a cop or the coefficient of performance for a heat sink and that is defined by this equation and 
Um, anyway, we, we don't have to get into the details. I'll share the paper with you. Uh, if time permits, please go through it. It's quite uh, well done work. So the coefficient of performance is the benefit divided by work consumed. So the cooling effect or whatever you want to call it. Um, so that that's that's how it is defined. And if you go look up, you know, different types of heat sink, parallel plate heat sink, pin pin heat sink, there is a specific uh, heat transfer coefficient associated with it, and a certain amount of mass of that heat sink that is being used. So if you plot all these things, what you find is that you do a very simple study that natural convection heat sink, the amount of mass that you require for a natural convection heat sink compared to an air cooled heat sink, you find that the mass is very high compared to the air cooled heat sink. So if you look at the whole energy consumption perspective, if I look at this, the mass of air cooled heat sink that is fan driven is very small compared to the mass of air cooled heat sink that is natural convection cooled. That mass is quite high. So this power consumption for the entire life period is very small compared to the mass of the natural convection heat sink. So that means what ends up, the conclusion is that you find that force convection heat sinks actually far outperform natural convection heat sinks because fan energy consumption is much smaller than the fabrication energy consumption for a natural convection heat sink, which is a not, not an intuitive answer. So it is actually quite an interesting answer. And the manufacturing methods um, that are required to uh, that are that are used for manufacturing can be designed or picked up based on minimum energy uh, energy consumption as well as a way of improving energy efficiency in the systems. And what they say is that even for natural convection heat sinks, it is better to shape the heat sink in such a way that mass is reduced. In that way, we if the overall mass is reduced, then this is an extruded heat sink. So there is, um, you're not subtracting mass rather than it is like a, whatever the mass that is extruded shows up as heat sink. So if your mass is reduced, then you really save a lot more energy from a holistic perspective, not just, you know, fan energy consumption. So the fan energy consumption turns out to be such a small thing compared to the overall perspective um, of mass of the heat sink. So that's the mass that is driven by the fabrication processes. So these are the primary reasons that I thought I should bring up because it's not quite common for many to see come to such a conclusion. So this I missed when I uh, when I was discussing about heat sinks. So I'll stop on this and uh, move to the next PowerPoint. So today, what I was going to spend a lot more time today is on heat pipes. Um, heat pipes are becoming quite common in uh, electronics cooling industry. And they are now, they have entered the smartphone market as well. And uh, now they are, uh, they are even moving from a simple heat pipe to a vapor chamber type solution. I will discuss that uh, subsequently. But you can see here is a base of a heat sink where this is where the heat source is supposedly located. And 
the heat pipe is this. I'll discuss what a heat pipe is. Heat pipe are highly conductive devices. So the heat is picked up by the heat pipe and on the other side is where the heat sink is or the fins are. That's where air cooled, uh, I mean, where you have a fan or something to cool that. Side. That is the condensing side of the heat sink and this is the evaporative side of the heat sink. This is the back side of the heat sink. And here is an example of a smartphone. This is a Samsung Galaxy 10, I think, where you see a heat pipe. This is a heat pipe that is picking up the heat source and dissipating over a larger base. And there have been some new uh, systems also that is coming up. This is an LG phone. You can see the model BLT32. So again, there is a heat pipe here where the heat is being picked up from here and it is spread over a larger base here. And there have been, this is from Fujitsu. I, I didn't quite. Uh, where they had proposed to use a loop heat pipe. These are thin loop heat pipes. Where there is a heater or heat source, that is the evaporator that will sit on the heat generating component and produce vapor and the vapor travels through this larger space and goes to a condenser where there is a large space because where there is a battery the heat generation is not that high uh, at least in the phones uh, so there they put this as use that as a condenser area to cool the loop and the liquid is formed here and that returns back to the evaporator so that's the loop heat pipe and um, so today I'll discuss more about this and its functionality. There's a lot of text I have put in the slides. That's because um, uh, when I share the slides, you should be able to uh, even uh, by reading it, you should be able to get some uh, picture about the uh, system. So. In general, there is always need to discuss boiling curves and uh, because at one extreme end of the heat pipe, boiling happens. So in a typical boiling curve, you have natural convection early on. This is the heat flux, watts per meter square. That's the vertical axis. And the horizontal is the wall superheat. That means when I have a surface, a flat plate, uh, and I'm heating from on the on this side and the liquid let's assume that for uh, for the sake of discussion is that uh, that liquid initially is not at its boiling point then when you supply heat when you supply heat flux to at the base then the temperature of the wall and um, will keep increasing but if the fluid was at saturation temperature until the bubbles start to form, initially there will be a temperature of the wall T wall Tw minus T saturation is the boiling point saturation temperature. And so until there is a certain difference, it will until the first bubble is nucleated, there will be this type of a very uh, this is a typically a semi log or log log plot. Um, the shown version is the semi log plot. So here, the first bubble is formed and it's usually referred as onset of nuclear boiling. And from there on, as you keep adding flux, you can see that the flux needed to, the wall temperature is not rising that much because this horizontal axis is not increasing at a very rapid rate like here. However, this could be only five degrees. Here, this could be another five degrees, but the flux has gone up significantly. Up. That is the so called partial nuclear boiling regime. And after that point, there's the partial nuclear boiling. You see individual sites in the surface generating bubbles and discrete. 
And once it com- gets closer to this fully developed flow, these individual sites where the bubble is being formed, they start to coalesce, coalesce and form larger and larger bubbles. And that is the fully developed nuclear boiling. At some point, it reaches what is called the material limit, where suddenly, if it is a hydrodynamic limit, suddenly vapor blankets that surface because the amount of energy or heat flux that was put into the device is so high that liquid that is returning back from condensation of the pool that is happening on the top back into that site where the liquid needs to be constantly supplied for vapor generation is cut off. At that point, suddenly you uh, reach a material limit, more or less material limit, not necessarily a uh, actual boiling limit, limit of the process here, that is called critical heat flux. And there it can jump if one is not careful with the experiments, the temperature will jump suddenly from let's say 120, 130 degrees to all the way to 400 degrees within a fraction of a second. That is called the critical heat flux here. However, if the boiling is controlled, then it goes through another subsequent two stages. One is the light and frost point, and there is a transition boiling region. This is a very, very unstable region. Then it goes to this so-called film boiling, which is more or less stable. And beyond this point, it becomes film boiling, and it is very stable. That's the boiling curve that one encounters. And some pictures are there. I thought I should show some videos. Um, for this, I will bring those up. So this is, uh, I don't know if this is coming across. This is the partial nuclear boiling regime where you see individually bubble sites where the bubble is being created and uh, the boiling is happening. That's a partially uh, partial nuclear boiling. This is a region where uh, now some of the sites that were generating individual bubbles have started to co lease. It is getting starting to look more like a fully developed boiling. And uh, you, can see, you cannot see the individual bubbles anymore. And you see some sort of a waviness. So what you, what you are seeing is that there is a heat source here. And uh, initially, you can see that when we just change. This is the partial nuclear boiling. Now, the next video, it will automatically jump to the. You can see the individual bubbles here. Now, it, will, it is shifted to a partial, close to a fully developed boiling regime where the bubbles are coalescing and you can't see the individual sites. So then, you get closer and closer to, now you can see it is starting to get closer to that critical heat flux. And you can see how the bubble is um, oscillating. There is a single bubble you can't see and it is vigorously moving left and right, left and right. And the next video, you will sort of get the picture of the critical heat flux. This is the, video where we saw critical heat flux in our experiment you can see that at some point the metal surface where it is boiling will become very shiny and you'll be able to see that surface i'll stop at that point 
can see that now this is the vapor and these areas are now open however they are more or less vapor blankets so this is a vapor blanket where when we shine the light from the top you're seeing that more or less it is being blanketed by the vapor that means it has reached a critical heat flux and the indication is that the temperature recorded jump, jumped from 150 to 400 degrees immediately within a second so again this is the partial nuclear boiling this is the closer to the starting of the fully developed boiling nuclear boiling now you are coming closer and closer to the critical heat flux it's in the fully developed boiling regime the last video is the critical heat flux that we were able to see is very very close to that critical heat flux and uh, in fact at the end we recorded critical heat flux so that's that's the four regimes that we just discussed So to understand um, heat pipes, then one also needs to understand a little bit about the condensation heat transfer as well. So there are two, as, as you may know, there are two main uh, modes of condensation that one discusses. One is the so-called drop-wise condensation, where the surface where the condensation is happening, where the, the vapor is, um, being condensed into a liquid that that is in in the form of drops so that's what is drop wise condensation when the it always begins as a drop wise condensation in many of these processes but as the drops start to coalesce and form they end up forming a film so that's the film wise condensation but what happens is because of these drops being smaller the heat transfer rate or the heat transfer coefficient of these drop-wise condensation processes are higher compared to the film-wise because the film itself is offering a resistance or condensation. So in a heat pipe, typically one, most of the time it is a film-wise condensation, but lately people have been trying to make use of the drop-wise condensation to uh, improve its performance and they try to develop what is called a thermal diode with the vapor chamber i will discuss that when we talk about vapor chambers at the end so the contact angle um, so one of the important uh, things to remember uh, in a heat pipe is that uh, one has to understand this contact angle contact angle is the angle between the solid liquid and the gas liquid interface so if I have a drop here and my solid surface, this drop is a liquid drop, then the angle the drop makes, the tangent of that drop at that drop gas and this angle and the solid surface, sorry, the liquid and the solid surface, this theta is the contact angle. You can see that if the drop is spreading, this is a um, example, where you see is here is a hydrophobic surface, subhydrophobic surface, that means the drop is like a ball. However, when the surface is hydrophilic, then the drop more or less wets the surface. And that's the contact angle. And one of the important aspect for heat pipe design is this Young-Laplace equation, where you have, when you have a meniscus, 
and you take a small capillary and insert it in a bath of liquid, the liquid rises in the capillary. So the interface where uh, you see this contact angle theta, where the pressure difference across that interface, which is the liquid side pressure difference and the liquid and the air and, or vapor uh, as shown here, that the pressure difference is called the capillary pressure. And it is related to the sigma, which is the sigma is the surface tension of the fluid. And R is the radius of curvature of the. So there are two possible radiuses. Because it's a 2D geometry, there is a radius one along the. So you will, you will find that you need to not only worry about the theta, but also the phi. Uh, the azimuthal angle as well uh, in some occasions. So one uh, writes two radii of curvatures, and that's what is shown here. But if it is a simple capillary tube of radius r, this radii can be simplified to this expression. This is r. And the cos theta is nothing but the sigma of surface tension between solid and the vapor, solid and the liquid divided by liquid and vapor. So this is cos theta uh, that one defines. And this is the simplified form of the Young-Laplace equation for a capillary tube that was inserted in a liquid. And it is written as capillary pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure that is on this side minus P. The P is the pressure on the liquid side is equal to two sigma cos theta by R. This is always balanced by the rho g h, the static head of the uh, liquid rise in the capillary. So this two sigma cos theta by r is one of the key uh, measures that one uses to design heat pipes. And we'll discuss that subsequently. So what is a heat pipe? Heat pipe is essentially a solid liquid um, uh, sorry, sealed, not solid liquid. I was wondering why I, where I was going. Sealed the liquid uh, pipe. Essentially, you take a sealed pipe, you evacuate that pipe, and you charge it with a little bit of liquid. And that, uh, if you heat it at one end and cool it at the other end, then it transports heat from where the heat was supplied to the place where it is uh, removed or condensing. So this is the simplest idea that one started with, which is called a thermosiphon uh, or Perkins tube. This was the simplest that was demonstrated very early on in 1940s, um, where the heat was supplied at the bottom. This is a gravity is pointing in this direction as shown here, often referred as Perkins tube. And uh, some of the flat plate solar heat uh, flat plate collectors use this principle where the solar heat is um, pushed on this side, the evaporator side, and uh, the water is heated, or the whatever the heat transfer fluid that is there inside this Perkins tube is heated. And the vapor rises up and condenses on the side where the heat is being removed. And so this is the Perkins tube where the condenser is on the top and the evaporator is on the bottom. So as the vapor rises, it condenses on this surface and the liquid condensed liquid returns back to the uh, evaporator. So the process is naturally circulating or it's a natural circulation. That's the thermosiphon. But however, in but this thermosiphon, if you keep it flat or uh, if you work the gravity in the opposite direction, that is essentially if you keep the evaporator on the top and condenser on the bottom, then it won't work. So that that is an issue because for some of the electronics is, for example, laptops and, uh, and uh, phones, people keep in all sorts of uh, angles and 
they can keep it upside down whatever the way they want so in such situations what has to enable a pathway for liquid to return to the evaporator and that is what a heat pipe does effectively in the sense that there is a mesh or a wick that is provided along the periphery of the heat pipe where the heat in this case this is an image obtained from thermocore where you supply heat and there is evaporation happening through the wick of that heat pipe where there are either it can be a mesh it could be a groove it could be a sintered particles so where the evaporation happens and the vapor goes through the center where there is not enough uh, there is empty space the vapor travels to the other end where it is being cooled and as it is being cooled this vapor condenses there and due to capillary action the liquid comes back to the original position so that's the heat pipe in in general that is often used in um electronics these days so here's a image of a heat pipe uh, where this is the cross section of the heat pipe let's say at section a a a where you bring um, the cross section shows that the orange is the outer envelope the white region is the wick or the capillary wick shown here and this white region is shown as gray region here and that is the empty space for vapor to flow so what literally happens is that heat is supplied at one end of the sealed tube it is sealed completely so any amount of heat supply, uh, supplied will create sufficient uh, the supplied energy just is used to evaporate and so the molecules leave that surface and the vapor travels in this so called vapor flow region and because it is being cooled at the other end the vapor condenses here and the condensed vapor returns back by capillary action uh, to the evaporator so this way now we have sort of overcome the gravity there is still a gravity effect in this but it is not as strong as in the um perkins tube this is what nowadays the heat pipe have become a workhorse in electronic cooling industry where for example this is a heat pipe uh, embedded heat sink assembly where heat source is on the other side of this and heat is being supplied to this evaporator side of the heat pipe and there is a vapor core region like here there are three heat pipes here one two three and the vapor travels all the way and it gets condensed on this surface and the liquid comes back to the evaporator so that's one of the assemblies of a heat pipe so if you look at the heat pipe operation there is conduction of heat transfer from where the heat is supplied across the evaporator wall where there is a outer envelope that is usually a copper and then to the wick as well from the con conduction also is similarly happening on the condenser side where it is pulled uh, across the wall and the wick and to provide vapor pressure difference to dry vapor from so these are the temperature differences one needs to put into the system i will explain the thermodynamics of a heat pipe in the next slide however most of the desirable properties of the working fluids are important to know actually in many occasions methanol is a better fluid than water in depending on the uh, type of heat pipes uh, that we are using in a vapor chamber also anyway desirable properties of working fluids are high latent heat and vaporization so water usually has very high heat latent heat vaporization high surface tension the surface tension as i said the uh, young laplace equation is 2 sigma cos theta by r so if sigma is high capillary pressure is high that means the ability to pump the liquid across from the condensing side to the evaporating side is high the pump, capillary pumping is better and it should have low viscosity the viscosity comes into the picture in the form of 
because the liquid is going through a wick. When the liquid is traveling through a wick, uh, the wick is offering certain amount of skin frictional losses. That means it's like a puzzle flow. If it is a groove, you can assume that to be a circular pipe or rectangular pipe. To simplify the thinking, then the skin friction needs to be uh, uh, reduced. Skin frictional losses should be reduced. In that case, you have to use a viscosity um, should be reduced as well. Low viscosities are better. And high thermal conductivity because you want to conduct the heat from where the heat source is into the liquid. So again, these are the desirable properties of fluids. And the weak characteristics that one really looks for is that we really need smaller capillary radius. As, I, as we discussed in the uh, young Laplace equation, that two sigma cos theta by r, if r is small, the capillary pressure again goes up. So we need to keep the r as much as small as feasible. So the r should not be so small that it generates so much pressure drop. Permeability is the ability of a liquid to flow through a porous media. So higher the permeability, lower will be the pressure drop. Because in these porous materials, you see Darcy uh, type flow, which is a linear uh, regime. Anyway, I won't get into that. Uh, then the finally, the wick should also have high effect of thermal conduct. These are the, so if you look at the thermodynamics of a heat pipe, what really happens is that, as we discussed, heat is being supplied and it evaporates on this part. So when I supply heat, this is the same location that I'm showing here. The, this is fluid pressure as a function of location. So when vapor is generated, the pressure, the fluid pressure or the vapor pressure is quite high at the evaporator end. Because, of, because you are supplying heat, so the pressure builds up, so the pressure is high. However, as the vapor travels through that space, the vapor flow space, there is always a, some sort of a frictional loss. Because of that, the vapor pressure drops as it travels towards the condenser side where it is condensed. So the finally, here, the, this is the pressure drop from the vapor, delta P, P. Then the liquid is generated, but the liquid is at a slightly higher pressure compared to the evaporator. So the liquid is now flows from the high pressure area to the low pressure zone of the liquid, which is the evaporator zone. So that is the delta P pressure drop across the in the liquid side. So when you add the two, the pressure drop in the vapor and the pressure drop in the liquid is equal to the capillary pressure. This is the driving pressure for liquid return from the evaporator. Sorry, liquid return from the condenser to the evaporator. So one has to ensure this capillary pressure is sufficiently high for the provided uh, heat flux. We will discuss that. So if I were to draw a TS diagram, the thermodynamic cycle of this entire process, this temperature, there are three temperatures that are dictated here. You can see here, there is temperature one, two and three. So let's go through this one by one by one. A is the, the zoom up of this area is shown here. A is here, A, B, because usually the liquid is somewhat subcooled when it comes back from the uh, condenser to the evaporator. So there is some amount of uh, heating that happens and then B that is shown here, B to C is the evaporator. Or uh, A, B, C is the evaporator side of this, essentially. All the processes that are happening in this area is represented by A, B, B to C. 
in in B C there is evaporation process. A to B is just a preheating process that is sensitive process. So from C, that is once the vapor is generated, the vapor is flowing from C to D, this region, which is this. There is a slight increase in entropy, however, it is going down. Um, that is, the entropy is increasing. The temperature is dropping because of condensation that is going to happen there. A D to E is the condenser. And from E back to A is this condensed liquid from the condenser goes back to the evaporator. That is the E and E. So this is the process um, that one thermodynamically looks at when E pipe is discussed. So what you find is that for the flow to happen, then you need to provide sufficient temperature difference between evaporator and the condenser, which is very important. That is, if you don't have sufficient temperature difference, then the whole cycle where the vapor is moving from evaporator to condenser and then the liquid moving from condenser back to evaporator will not happen because the fluid frictional losses will be sufficiently high that it cannot overcome. So the temperature difference is a key in establishing this flow. However, when you open a heat pipe book, what happens is people start discussing on what are called the limits of a heat pipe. I'll just show those. You will find that most books start with this discussion, which is capillary limit, viscous limit, sonic limit, entrainment limit, and a boiling limit. So many book people say when they are discussing about heat pipes, is they always are so worried about capillary limit that they don't fail to explain. What is the process? What is actually driving this? Capillary limit is only uh, an aspect where we are talking about fluid frictional losses. It doesn't explain how a heat pipe operates. So it is only a limiting condition. So if I were to do experiments by a heat pipe and start doing some experiment, the capillary limit is what is shown here as some sort of a envelope here. This is the theory where one says viscous limit, then sonic limit. This is the capillary limit, and then entrainment limit, and then back to boiling limit. So when you start ex doing some uh, heat pipe uh, experiments, this is the heat transfer rate in watts, and this is the operating temperature of the heat pipe. Essentially, average of condenser temperature and evaporator temperature. That's the operating temperature. If you plot, you see that it is more or less a straight line. So that's why heat pipes can be easily represented as a conduction heat transfer device. By suitably, if it is, if you suitably multiplying by a factor, you will get fairly good uh, representation of heat pipe. And in many of the electronic cooling softwares, heat pipes are often treated as some sort of a, a simplification as just four times the thermal conductivity of copper or three times the thermal conductivity of copper. So you will get actual results are here, but the limits are here. So these are limits of an operation, not necessarily the function. So this limit cannot explain why it is a linear line here. So anyway, coming back to the thermodynamics part, what you find is that in a heat pipe, when it enters the, you know, the working fluid enters the evaporator at T1 and is raised to upper wall. I will not go through this. I will leave it for uh, you to read it if you are interested later on. So the point is that the pressure drop of the liquid returning to the evaporator, that is the liquid side pressure drop is P3 minus T1, while the vapor side pressure drop is P2 minus P3. So let's look at this here. So 
because this is a TS diagram, so there are three pressures here P1, P2, and P3. So the liquid, two, as we discussed before, this line BC is the evaporator line, BE is the condenser line. So P2 is associated with evaporator, P3 is associated with condenser, P1 is the pressure. Again, discussed with respect to the vapor side. We'll just look at that. So P2 minus P3 is the vapor side pressure drop, and P3 minus P1 is the liquid side pressure drop. So the capillary pressure is the summation of these two pressure drops. So what it says is that unless you have sufficient temperature difference, then this P3 and P2 cannot be generated. So for pressure difference to occur, that is for the flow to happen, the temperature difference becomes the critical process. So in order, if you keep higher the temperature difference, you are able to move the heat, you can move a lot more heat, or you can even move for a lot longer distance as well. So that becomes the critical aspect of design of a heat pipe, that to supply that sufficient temperature difference. So that's the point I wanted to get across. So if you look at heat pipe mix, that's the quick uh, summary of the thermodynamics of heat pipes. And going back to this, which is, if you look at a heat pipe, this is an image from Cooler Master, uh, one of the suppliers of heat pipes. Um, majorly, there are three types of wicks that are used. One is this sintered wick. This is a very high capacity uh, heat pipe. The other is the grooved heat pipe. And the third one is the mesh heat pipe. These meshes are inserted. So the conduction path is not that great because the mesh needs to be in complete contact with the solid surface to enable good conduction. However, if that process is not done well, then this may not work well. On the other hand, the grooved pipes have a very good flow of heat from the base where if you are supplying heat here, it will blow into the groove pins and go into the grooves where the liquid will. One of the most commonly used high performing heat pipes are the so-called sintered powder. So the capillary wicks, as we discussed, uh, the functionality is that we discussed that desirable characteristic is that we want capillary radius to be small so that it can generate large capillary pressure, two sigma by R. And permeability should be high such that liquid trace pressure drop is low. On the other hand, high effective thermal conductivity is also needed to minimize thermal resistance. In the heat pipe. So we see that all these three parameters will vary depending on what kind of mesh or uh, groove or this entire particle is used. So there are many, many varieties of heat pipes, wrapped screen, open annulus, there are arterial pipes as well where there is some amount of liquid here. If there is dry out, this liquid that is excess liquid that is stored here supplies that liquid to that area where there is a dry out and so on. So And also you can put arteries in the wick itself. There are many different varieties that are there. And uh, the capillary radius of these things can are well documented in books. And I'm just showing these for reference. The permeability is also well documented in books. They're all given here for your reference if it's not for any discussion. So if you look at the capillary pumping aspect, which is an important aspect, is that as we discussed previously, the capillary pressure, if there is, if the heat pipe is in the uh, horizontal direction, then the pressure draw due to gravity is zero. If the condenser is on the 
top and evaporator is on the bottom, like a Perkins tube type arrangement, then the pressure gradient, uh, sorry, gravity driven pressure, this becomes positive. So the capillary pressure plus the pressure drop due to gravity is balanced by the pressure drop in the liquid plus pressure drop in the vapor. Usually the pressure drop in the vapor is almost negligible. However, the pressure drop in the liquid cannot be ignored. If the evaporator is on the numerator, sorry, is on the top and condenser is on the bottom with respect to the gravity direction, then this becomes, this is the right expression. That means the gravity will also resist the compare. It will oppose the capillary action in such cases. So if the maximum capillary pressure that is given um, is or calculated or designed for is exceeded, then most likely at certain heat flux condition, depending on the temperature differences and so on, dry out of the evaporator can happen. And this is what we have discussed previously as well. So this is the vapor, this is pressure, fluid pressure as a function of distance. This is the dis this is this is L sub E is the evaporator length. L sub A is the adiabatic region section that is often referred as adiabatic section, but there is no adiabatic nothing to I don't know why it is called adiabatic section, but however it is always referred as adiabatic section. But there is nothing is essentially says that there is no heat input or or uh, heat removal in that section, but it is not adiabatic because there is still conduction of heat from the evaporator region as well as from the condenser. So that is that section, and the third one is the condenser section. The vapor drops from here to here from the evaporator where the vapor pressure is high and it drops, and then the liquid pressure. When there is no gravity force assisting, then the liquid pressure is like this. If there is adverse gravity force, then it looks like this. So if you look at zoom into the evaporator section, and if you have some wires, let's say meshes as wicks, so what really happens is that you form some sort of a meniscus like this, where the capillary pressure is now written as two sigma cos theta e, e is sign for evaporator, divided by four, radius of the four of the evaporator minus cos theta c is the contact angle of the condenser side divided by r. In many occasions, people try to make, this is where when designing a heat pipe, one thinks of, you want to make the theta e equal to the cos theta e to be one. That means the evaporator contact angle needs to be zero, while the condenser contact angle needs to be 90, so that to achieve these things. So that's when the maximum capillary pumping is achieved. So when people try to do it, that's why, uh, you know, the contact angle are tweaked in some of these new designs or research papers where people try to put hydrophobic surfaces at one end and hydrophilic surfaces at the other end. So hydrophilic surfaces give you zero contact angles. So you want to keep it, keep them at the evaporator side and hydrophobic surfaces give you fairly, uh, you know, large contact angles there you put it on the condenser side. So the meniscus on the condenser side looks like this versus the meniscus on the evaporator side. So that's how people uh, work the heat pipe in general in terms of design. So in terms of pressure drop, how to calculate this? So I've been saying this is the pressure drop. So one can use the gravity head is well known. If the, if the heat pipe is at an angle to the uh, vertical, or horizontal here it is defined in terms of then sine pi the angle should be accounted for l is the um, 
is the gravity essentially effective length based on the midpoints of evaporator and condenser and rho gh essentially the formula is static head and the liquid side pressure drop is given by the darcy's law because the flow liquid flow in these wicks are very very small flow rates are small so it is given by mu is the dynamic viscosity of the fluid l effective is the length of the flow from condenser to the midpoint of the condenser to the midpoint of the evaporator m dot is the mass flow rate which needs to be figured out k is the permeability of the wick and it is well documented rho is the density and a sub w is the cross sectional area of the wick on the other hand if you had this is when you have wicks like a mesh or a, a sintered particle this you use this expression however if you have a groove then uh, the classical uh, this is uh, you know 64 by r re which is the flow through a fully developed flow through a tube is used however you can put a better approximation of a rectangular groove or something like that so that is all this is the vapor side pressure drop can also be calculated assuming the flow of a vapor is through a circular tube and that is this expression and one always assumes that the flow is fully developed in in uh, and they sort of very small so the it does account uh, reasonably okay with this expression so the capillary limit as you can see is this so using the 2 sigma by r is the capillary pressure obtained from the young laplace equation sigma is the surface tension this is the gravity this is the uh, liquid side pressure drop and this is the vapor side pressure drop and maximum heat transfer rate uh, that can be obtained is this m maximum which is yet to be figured out times the latent heat of the fluid that is the maximum you can obtain this m max can be calculated by other means by using this because now if you put this and you know q max or you can calculate q max and you can use this expression and this expression to get it but anyway that is not uh, that i will spend maybe in the later later section here so there is a figure of merit that is usually used to calculate um the uh to estimate which fluid should be used for a given situation if you see there are nitrogen methanol uh ammonia water sodium depending on the temperature most of the electronic cooling heat pipes tend to have water as the fluid so this figure of merit is nothing but density of the liquid times surface tension times the latent heat divided by dynamic viscosity and it naturally occurs when you manipulate this equation uh, once you substitute m dot with that q max by h of g if you look for a way to increase q max then this occurs naturally you will get this term so there are five limits that are often discussed there are other limits as well but five limits that there are often discussed in heat pipes as heat pipe limits one is the capillary pressure or the capillary limit where the liquid flow um, from the condenser is unable to reach the evaporator that is the so called drying out of the wick that happens that is called the capillary limit and the sonic limit is the limit where the vapor flow the amount of heat flux supplied is so high that vapor generated is flowing at a very high flow rate that it is choking essentially it has reached the sonic velocity of that uh, in situ increase in uh, even if you increase the amount of heat the mass flow rate of vapor won't increase because it it is choked so that means the heat pipe will cease to operate beyond a certain point so because the vapor now is restricted Uh, is restricting the performance. That is the vapor side limit, the sonic limit. Entrainment is the third limit where, because the vapor is flowing in the opposite direction to the liquid, 
at very high vapor velocities, the returning liquid can be carried over by the vapor itself to the condenser. That means the amount of returning liquid to the evaporator is reduced. And that is again a vapor side limitation. There is a viscous limit where viscous forces, the pressure drop in the liquid, uh, pressure drop for liquid to flow through the wick is so high that um, this is also true for vapors as well, but you can think of viscous limit from the liquid side as well. It is so high that it is unable to return to the evaporator. And if you are talking about vapor forces, there the viscous forces prevent vapor flow to happen because at very low temperature is what the viscous limit happens. Because the viscosity of gas is high and that the viscous forces are preventing the vapor to flow from evaporator to condenser. And finally, there is this boiling limit that happens when boiling happens in the wick. So whenever bubbles are formed in the wick, and if the wick is not designed such that to enable boiling, what happens is the bubble, as the bubble grows, it now uh, creates a local dry out area. That means the heat pipe is unable to bring liquid into that area. That means the, locally the heat pipe is seeing high temperatures. That is the boiling limit. So all these limits have some expressions. That is what I've captured here. And if you put them all in one picture, Operating temperature as function of heat, heat pipe heat transfer rate, and it is given by this. Viscous limit is at a very low temperature, sonic limit. Then the capillary limit is shown by this blue line. Entrainment limit is the green line, and the boiling limit is the red line. And most of the cases, when you do the experiments, only at this point this heat pipe ceases to operate. But below that, these limits. Heat pipe will always have a linear line when you draw, uh, when you plot against heat transfer rate versus the operating temperature. You'll always see a fairly linear uh, line. And if you were to represent it in the form of a resistance network, so this, these are the heat source. There is a resistance from the heat source to the heat pipe itself. There is some sort of a contact resistance here. Then there is a resistance in the wall of the heat pipe. But there is an axial resistance as well because there is a certain resistance going here. There is a heat flow path here and another heat flow path. Typically, this, if the heat pipe is long, then this resistance is higher. So most of the preferred, preferred heat flow path is through the wick and into the vapor. And from the vapor side into the wick, again, there is axial conduction in the wick itself, axial conduction in the wall itself, and then to the heat. So this is fairly complex if one were to calculate all these resistances. So in many occasions, people put only three resistances. They treat this whole thing as a three resistance network. One is through the wick of the evaporator, then the vapor space, and through the wick of the condenser. They ignore all these parallel, the axial conduction in the wick and axial conduction in the wall itself. So there's one, one resistance, they call it evaporator resistance, vapor flow resistance, and condenser resistance. That's it. And that is often used in the industry. Um, so this is how it looks like. So there are many, many working fluids that people have explored for cryogenic fluids, helium, hydrogen, neon, and so on. Moderately, water is usually a very good fluid, even up to 300 degrees Celsius, because it's a sealed fluid as you pump uh, flow uh, heat flow into the system, the temperature of the operating temperature can be increased all the way close to 300 degrees Celsius. And even heat pipes are used for very high temperatures as well. Like sodium heat pipe is quite well established technique for high temperature uh, systems. And uh, so these are some of these fluids that are often used in heat pipes. Moving on. Um, so, uh, if you look at the recent vapor chambers, these are some new uh, so cell phones that are coming to market. And this Razer Phone 2 uh, is, a, is a gaming phone, cell phone, uh, smartphone, where you can do a lot of people buy these Razer phones for 
playing games on their phones. And because of gaming, the power consumed is quite high. So here they have used what is called a vapor chamber instead of a heat pipe because it provides better heat spreading. Cooler Master, again, uh, a company that sells all these products, uh, has a very interesting vapor chamber design. <laughs> If you look at the Razer Phone 2, and this was a, a teardown from a website, you can see the WIC is shown here in the form of patterns. And uh, this is a very, very, very thin heat pipe. The thickness, the total thickness of this paper chamber is less than one millimeter. So it's a very thin because the mobile requires such thin uh, uh, vapor chambers. So what is a vapor chamber? So a vapor chamber is very similar to a heat pipe, except that now it is oriented in this way, where there is a heat source. There is an evaporator region. The idea of a vapor chamber is to split the heat better. So the heat enters the wick and the vapor is generated. In that way, heat is spread. Now the vapor generation goes and condenses on the larger surface. So now the heat is spread from a smaller heat source to a larger area. On the top of it is where the condenser is. So that's the vapor chamber that uh, um, you know, that I've been talking about in cell phones as well. So you use the heat. Uh, you can see the thermal interface material that is, uh, you know, where this vapor chamber would have been in contact with. So the heat is spread from this small area to such a large area because of the vapor generated from this. That's the effect of a vapor chamber. And so you take heat from one corner, you can even have the heat source here and you can spread it over a large area. And on top of it is the heat sink. In the phone case, now it is spread over the large area of the backside of the phone to dissipate the heat. That's the vapor chamber. Um, and there are people who now come up with these innovative ideas. <laughs> is to make the top surface, if the gravity is pointing this way, we can prevent the heat, we can make the heat flow. One of the challenging aspects of uh, heat transfer is that you can't prevent the heat flow in the back tire, back, back side. If, if heat flows from location X to the location Y, it can also, if I provide heat source on the top, it can also come back. But with a clever design, what people have done is that, if you make the top surface a super hydrophobic surface and the bottom surface a hydrophilic surface and the side walls are adiabatic, like a plastic or adiabatic or very poorly conducting material. So if you supply heat and this is the gravity direction, gravity is pointing downwards. So if you supply heat, the vapor, the, the liquid will generate vapor and the vapor will condense on the top. And because it is a super hydrophobic surface, it will form only liquid droplets and the drops fall back into the wick. So that way, the process continues. However, if I take the heat source and put it on the top and put the heat sink on the bottom, but the gravity is still pointing downwards, once I supply heat, whatever little water that was there, will evaporate, that's it. After that, there is no way for the liquid to return from the condensing side, which is the bottom to the top. That way you prevent heat to flow from the back, in the back, back direction. Instead, you allow the heat to flow only from bottom to top and not from top to bottom. So now this acts like a thermal diode. So these vapor chambers allow these type of innovative ideas where you can allow heat to flow in only one direction and not in the other direction. So these are some um, 
some recent developments on the vapor chambers and in fact the phones are shrinking in size so much so that the vapor chambers are now designed for less than a millimeter thick but then there are some interesting new limits are uh, encountered where vapor space is so small the vapor cannot flow and so you are running into some you know even in some occasions some non continuum limits may also occur depending on how the vapor um, and the expectation is this vapor chamber will shrink even less than 0.5 millimeters that is including the thickness of the wall the wick and the vapor space everything including should be less than 0.5 millimeters so which makes it extremely challenging to design and engineer actually so these are some new developments that are happening and uh, i will stop at this point and on uh, dr prashant Yes, sir. Uh, it's only you today, and uh, not others. Uh, not many others joined. Um, so I'm going to take a break now. Um, yes, sir. For a ten minutes. Yeah, ten minutes. We'll meet at uh, three thirty then. Yes, sir. Definitely, sir. We will meet at three thirty. Yeah. Thank you. We'll. I'll just. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, hello, Dr. Prashant. Are you back? Yes, sir. We can start, sir. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, the heat pipes uh, is something that uh, that was covered. Uh, have you gone through that before? No, sir. Have you shared it on the uh, Moodle? Uh, no, I have not. I shared most of the video, all the recorded videos yesterday. All of them should be there. Okay. On that uh, link that I had sent. So what I will, I am planning to put all the materials, all these PDFs. Right, sir. Also on the same drive itself, instead of in Moodle, but I will send a Moodle message saying all, all of them are there in that link. My problem is that uh, um, there were so many people who registered for the yes, course. Sir. Yes, yes. And uh, but uh, only today, only you are there. Um, uh, it's been only six or seven who in the last class. Um, so I don't. If I send a modal message, it will go to all those who registered who didn't even participate. Right, right, right. So uh, what I'll do is I copy emails and send it to you personally. Right, uh, sir. That will be better, sir. Yeah. So be yeah, I'll do that today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because uh, day before yesterday, I checked the modal for uh, any uh, material, uh, learning material, but it was not there. Uh, but the so, uh, the link that I had shared last time, uh, I will share it again. Just a second. Yes, sir. Uh, you're talking about uh, class link, joining link? No, no. The video. Uh, so all the videos have I'll, I've already uploaded. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Uh, the materials I will upload today. Uh, right. Sir. Right. Because sir. I was waiting for day one, day two. Otherwise, it will be confusing. 
ओके ओके नो प्रॉब्लम so this link i will upload the pdfs as well tonight it will be day 1 day 2 day 3 types okay no problem sir no problem no problem yeah okay i'll get started now yes sir yes sir. so on this uh the next technology um that i will discuss is one of the um very few technologies that actually can be used to do what is called precision temperature control is thermoelectrics uh or thermoelectric modules um the primarily the application occurs in optoelectronics or optical routers where the information is being passed through uh, an optical fiber cable or something and where the temperature needs to be maintained precisely within uh, i will do an example as well to give an idea but if the temperature is not maintained then the information that is passed through that fiber uh, is distorted so that is a very important aspect of this so very few technologies allow to control the temperatures to a specified for example i want to maintain 70 degrees celsius the heat sink if the ambient temperature if ambient is varying so much from minus 5 degrees to all the way to 50 degrees or 55 degrees i can't ensure the heat sink will always give me 70 degrees in such situation a technology should be used such that when it when the ambient is cold it needs to provide heating when the ambient is hot it needs to do the cooling so uh, thermoelectric modules are very very unique in that and they are robust as well and but they have their own drawbacks there are many advantages there are many disadvantages uh, one one significant disadvantage is their energy efficiency is poor however for applications where we cannot uh, accept any sort of uh, you know failures like in the optical packages there thermoelectric modules become quite a useful technology thermoelectrics have also been used to generate power as well for example in the spacecrafts that nasa had sent back in 1969 which is still traveling uh, the power generation is done through thermoelectric power modules um, where they use radio isotope to generate heat and they use the cold temperature out in the space so the temperature difference drives the power or gives you the power output that power output is sufficient to keep all the communication and signal uh, equipment that is there in the spacecraft so that the so thermoelectrics have been around for a very long period of more than 100 years only recently their performance have been improved because of some lot large amount of funding and so on so um here's a Thermal, there are three main thermoelectric effects one is the so called seebeck effect second one is the peltier effect and the third one is the uh, thomson effect i notice a uh, copy paste error here let me fix that
So Seebeck effect is generation of voltage or uh, electromotive force in electrical conductors, including semiconductors, when they are subjected to temperature gradients. If you supply temperature gradient across an electrical conductor in an open loop, essentially they are not closed. Two ends of the, the electrical wire is not closed. Then it produces a certain voltage, and it is often given by this mathematical expression, which is dV, the voltage difference generated, is equal to alpha, that's the so-called Seebeck coefficient, times the temperature difference that was supplied at the two ends. That is the Seebeck effect, and that's what we make use of for measuring thermocouples, uh, for measuring temperature in thermocouples. It is a bulk effect. It is not an interfacial effect. I will explain what an interfacial effect now, which is the Peltier effect. Peltier effect is when you put two dissimilar conductors, one a dissimilar here, meaning that one, one conductor or electrical conductor has more number of electrons, the other one has more number of holes, that is the positive charges. And uh, when you pass a current uh, through that, uh, now it is a closed circuit, that these two conductors are connected at two ends. And when you pass a current, then one end of it will see heating, the other end will see cooling. And that is called the Peltier effect. And it happens only at those interfaces where the, the two con conductors are connected. It is not a bulk effect, like a dual heating type situation. It is a interfacial effect and it is given by the amount of heat that is absorbed or liberated is given by this expression i is the current times alpha is the Seebeck coefficient of the material 2 minus alpha is the Seebeck coefficient of material 1 times the temperature t at that particular interface so one interface will see positive that is heating the other interface will see cool. The Thomson effect, which is the third effect, is the so-called, uh, when you supply a temperature gradient to a conductor, not temperature difference, but temperature gradient, um, then there is heating or cooling that happens in a conductor. And this is a bulk effect. Thomson effect is, for cooling purposes, Thomson effect can be typically neglected because the temperature gradients are small. However, when you are dealing with heat uh, power generation using thermoelectric modules, there's a large temperature gradient. So in such cases, then Thomson effect needs to be accounted for. Thomson effect, because it's given by this expression, dQ, Q is the heat generated, divided by dx, equal to this partial, uh, not partial law. dQ by dx is the ordinary differential is equal to I is the current, T is the temperature, T alpha, alpha is the Seebeck coefficient by T, um, temperature, and differential in temperature divided by dx, that's the gradient. So this is the expression that often uses Thomson, and that's the Thomson effect. So for most of the cooling applications, only the first two effects come into picture, and Thomson effect is usually neglected because the gradient is small. As I mentioned to you, Seebeck is a bulk effect. LTA is the only surface effect. And Thomson effect is also a bulk effect. All these are reversible. Essentially, if you change the polarity, it will change. If I change plus and minus and minus and plus, then all these. However, because you are passing current through all these devices, the two additional effects that come into picture. One is the Julian heating, Joule heating. Because your current passing current through a conductor, so there is square. There is a I square R type loss. I is the current here, R is the resistance of the wire. And then because now you have heating at one end and cooling at the other end, there will be conduction of heat because heat is going to flow from high temperature to lower temperature. There is always a back conduction of heat that is also an irreversible effect that comes into picture. So if you look at thermoelectric modules, the construction of a thermoelectric module is always, uh, it looks like this. Essentially, it has a ceramic plate 
then these are the so-called thermoelectric pellets. And each one is, uh, usually these are semiconductors these days. So bismuth tellurium, BI is bismuth, TE is tellurium. Um, these are the bismuth tellurium pellets. And one is a P type and the other is the N type. P is the uh, one that carries a lot more positive charges. N is the uh, uh, pellet that carries a lot more poles, sorry, uh, electrons. That is the negative charges. So then these are the electrically, all these P and N are electrically in series. However, the thermal path is parallel. Only because of the P and N connection that is in series, that heat is always, you maintain that heating happens only on one side and the cooling happens only on the other side. That's why it needs to be done in such a way that P and N, the, all the electrical connections are in series while the thermal connections are in parallel. So in this is a gen, simple construction where there is a ceramic plate. So these pellets are co connected metallically by using some soldering or something. Then on top of the soldered piece, there is a ceramic, which is a dielectric that is kept so that the current doesn't go to the other where this module is interfacing with. So the ceramic is there, construction is there. And similarly, on the bottom side, you see plus and minus so if you reverse plus and minus then if if you have this type then the top side may be cooling the bottom side may be heating this is like a heat pump if you reverse it the bottom side will start cooling start cooling and the top side will start heating and generally for achieving very very cold temperatures a cascaded module like this a small large module to small module to small this is called cascading is used. So if you get higher and higher temperature drop, that is very dropping the temperature even below, well below ambient, this cascaded technologies are used for. But when, when it comes to power generation, there is something called segmentation. There is multiple thermoelectric materials are used and stacked like this. Within the same pellet, there are multiple thermoelectric. Yet this is all bismuth tellurine, tellurium or telluride material. Here you see there's some 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 material, another some something, something. So this is P P connection, P plus, or this is N uh, N pellet. So for power generation purpose, you segment it for cooling, you wash usually cascade it. Thermoelectric module, as you can see, is a six 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 seventy million dollar uh, per year industry. Um, and it is expected to go about $1 million by 2024. So spending a little bit more time on this, you can see a closer picture of this. You have, <coughs> there are a number of uh, options. Uh, first, let's just look at, this is one connection. Let's say we are going to operate in, uh, use the module for heating. So these thermo, same thermoelectric module can be used as I mentioned to you for heating, cooling, refrigeration, and power generation. So it is very, very robust. So with one module, but however, typically one uses it, as I talked to you about segmentation and others for power generation, you use it. <coughs> Excuse me. So for power generation, usually other materials are uh, used, but, but one can use the same module for power generation as well, but they are not quite efficient. So if you do cooling, then this RL, which is the road load resistance is not there. We'll discuss why you need load resistance later, but however, when you have, when you're trying to cool it, you can supply, let's say this is a positive terminal and this is a negative terminal. And as you can see, these are the positive pellets 
T pellets and these are N type semiconductor. P type semiconductor, N type semiconductor. So they are connected by these taps. So you can let's look at this. This is a this area is a metallic tap. So it is connected to N type and that connects to a P type and that connects to a N type and you know, so they electrically they are wired in series. Because of this way it is wired, you will see that one side will always be heated or cold. The other side will always be heated or cold depending on this positive or negative. Okay, so. <clears throat> So what this does is that, let's say you're trying, so this is the site where the terminals are, the opposite side is the site that you have control over. That is the site you can place a heat source or an electronic device, which we want to control its temperature. And often it is better to refer it as controlled site ceramic, because in precision temperature control, you may be operating this module in the heating mode or cooling mode. So in many books and uh, literature, you will find that people call hot side and cold side for thermal body. But in a precision temperature uh, control, that hot side will become suddenly cold side. Cold side will become suddenly hot side. So calling it hot side and cold side has no value in it and actually will cause confusion. So instead, you have to say as control side, is the side where you actually have a control. So if you change the polarity, that is the side you have a control over. So that's the that's the side opposite to the terminals. That's the control side ceramic. On the opposite end is the uncontrolled side. That is as a as mark here. This is coming from Mark Hodes. Um, he's uh, one of my uh, ex-colleague um, anyway it's coming from his paper this uh, technology so use this uncontrolled and control side um, as a way of explaining for the for the analysis that i will carry out next so if you don't supply the power supply if you don't provide power so then you don't heat or cool on one side however you use this module to generate power very much similar to a photovoltaic panel. Now, if you are using this to develop power, then you will supply a hot temperature or some temperature gradient, hot and cold here, and it will drive the electrical current through this. So in order to drive the current out of this module, then you have to provide a load resistance the resistive load in the generation mode. So that's why this RL is supplied here. Then because matching of this load with the with the thermoelectric module is needed to drive the current out of the thermoelectric module to a battery charger or, or the wherever you want to use it, um, use this power. So the, the power output of a thermoelectric module is always DC, a direct current. So, very similar to a photon bag. So now these are multiple uh, construction feasibilities of a thermoelectric module. So next we'll uh, talk a little bit about analysis of these modules briefly. And we are going to treat that we are trying to cool on one side or heat one side. We are not going to talk about uh, the power generation in this discussion because the, the application that uh, um, that I'm going to discuss today is um, precision temperature control. So you want to maintain the temperature of an electronic component within a certain range, say plus or minus one degree uh, of a 70 degree Celsius control temperature. So the control side is the side, as I mentioned to you previously, uh, where we want to maintain the device at certain temperature. And the terminology often says that, you know, the positive current is the direction of the flow of positive electrons or positive charges, which is volts. 
Uh, so here's the much detailed discussion. So this is the the pink object is the object that needs to be cooled or heated, and <coughs> We are not going to talk about power generation, so that's that's the only thing. So then that object will make an interface with the ceramic substrate. That ceramic is a dielectric substrate, so that the power uh, that is electric current that is flowing through this doesn't affect the performance of this object that needs to be cooled or heated. So then we have an electrical interconnect that connects the P-type semiconductor with the N-type semiconductor. Uh, that is mounted in series and this side is often called or not often that's the side we will call as control side and let's assume that a coordinate axis x originates from that and at this x equal to zero we will call the temperature to be at some dc thermoelectric modules always give very uh, a more or less isothermal temperatures at that uh, interface so they're quite good at providing isothermal surfaces. So let's call that T equal to TC. Then the other end is the so-called uncontrolled side where the terminals are there, positive or negative terminals. And that is the uncontrolled side and we'll call that temperature associated with that as uncontrolled term, uh, temperature, uncontrolled side temperature. And that is after a certain length of this. This P shown here is the semiconductor pellet. But usually uh, when you have this P and N, it is called a P and N thermocouple, sometimes couple. This thermocouple should not be uh, confused with the thermocouple that is used for measuring, but that is the terminology often used is the thermocouple. There is something called unicouple as well, where this P and type N is, uh, uh, anyway, we shouldn't go there. Um, there is a unicouple as well, but here the combination of P type and N type is called thermocouple of a thermoelectric module. So they are always in pairs. N number of those pairs make a full module. So there is when you pass, when you supply current to this, then you are able to control the temperature of the object that is sitting here. So when you pass current at the interface is where Peltier effect happens. Similarly, there is a bulk effect, Seebeck effect that also happens. We are going to ignore the Thomson effect that we discussed briefly. And this interface is where cooling happens, and this is the interface where heating is happening. So the heat generated by this object is cooled by this. So essentially, is being pumped from this interface to this interface. On top of the heat generated, because we are supplying certain amount of power to this thermoelectric module, that additional work that was supplied is also dissipated as heat on this side, which is the uncontrolled side. So not only the heat from this heat source, but also the extra heat uh, will be generated because you are passing current through this and heat will be conducted. So you have to now account for back conduction of heat from this hot side to the colder side as well. So that's what we'll do now. And making some making some uh, as assumptions like contact resistance are negligible. And mostly these heat flows are one dimensional in nature because of these pellets. As you can see, some of these pellets, real pellets are shown here. They tend to be one dimensional in nature. And we'll treat the uncontrolled side and control side to be isothermal and given by TU and TC. And you can look at a right energy balance across that to derive the heat equation. Essentially, you have some conduction happening through the pellet where there is heat generation due to I square R, um, joule heating. And there is 
certain amount of conduction exiting that control volume. If you write that energy balance and then you get this is simply a conduction equation with key generation. That's all this is. And subjected to a boundary condition that there is a control side temperature at x equal to zero and uncontrolled side temperature at the x equal to L. The solution is given by in, uh, by this expression in the dimensional form. However, you can non-dimensionalize it using this form. Then you get a nice parameter, the psi as i square r by 2k and tu minus tc. You should recall that tu and tc are uh, treated to be known, or that's the target temperature. And capital R is 2 rho L by AP, which is the electrical resistance, and rho is the resistivity, and K is thermal conductivity, and K is the thermal conductance of the system. And that's what this is used here. When there is no heat generation, then in the linear equation that one typically obtains for heat conduction in a solid form. So what this is is just purely temperature distribution in the electrical conductor or the pellet. However, the interface is where the Peltier cooling is happening. So and there is Seebeck effect also needs to be accounted for. And that's what we'll do next. At the surface energy, where we need to account for two things. One is heat conduction from and to the substrate, uncontrolled or controlled side, and Peltier cooling or heating, and heat conduction from to the pellets. Okay. So there is heat conduction that is going to happen from this side into this and into this interface, heat conduction happening from pellets to this interface, and Peltier cooling or heating happening at these two interfaces. So that's the surface energy balance. And when you write the surface energy balance at the controlled side, this I alpha T, this you may recall as the Seebeck effect. I is the current, alpha is the average of the P type and N type Seebeck coefficient times TC is the temperature of the control side minus 2K. Because heat is always moving away from that. So this is the conduction loss. Two is appearing because there is conduction happening to the pellet side and then to the substrate, which is on the heat generator, the device side. <coughs> Similarly, you can write it and you know the temperature distribution in the pellet. This is given by this expression. And using that and substituting it here, then one obtains the heat transfer rate equal to the CPEC effect and the conduction loss in the pellet. And this is the I square R, the heat generation. So you can see that you can make a guess that the best case scenario is obtained the highest heat dissipation by the thermoelectric module or the pellet is obtained when the back conduction is zero and the i square r is zero which is not feasible because those are irreversible losses but you will notice that this is the uncontrolled side if you do the same energy balance on the uncontrolled side as well you will get this expression where this is i is the current going through that pellet alpha is the average seebeck coefficient p sub u is the temperature of the uncontrolled side minus conduction term plus because the work input into the system was I square R type work input that also shows up as additional heat that needs to be dissipated out of the thermoelectric module. So this is the expression for the heat flux at those or heat transfer rate at control side and the uncontrolled side. So to obtain what is the maximum current that will yield QC maximum, because you see that there are two possibilities that can be seen here. There is a positive I and there is a negative I square. So this term, if you increase the current, this term will keep increasing 
positively. On the other hand, this will keep decreasing it. So at some point, at some critical I, you will see that this will be dominating. So QC will start dropping or it will go to a zero as well. So the point is to figure out what is the maximum current that will fetch us QC. Now, this can be easily obtained by you know, differentiating QC with respect to I and setting that to zero. Essentially using the principle of finding the maximum or local maximum or minimum. So here we are trying to find out the maximum current that will give us the maximum heat transfer rate at the control side. So once I differentiate this QC with respect to I, then I'm setting that to zero, then I get a current I from that because there will be this two I R by two, so you will have I there. So that will fetch us this expression, alpha C by coefficient times Temperature of the control side divided by R, the electrical resistance. If you take this I max and substitute it into QC, then you get this expression. A very interesting, very good expression that gives us a very intuitive answer, which is saying that alpha square, the Seebeck coefficient square times TC square by 2R minus K. So for us to <coughs> get maximum heat transfer rate, then we need to have thermal conductivity of these thermoelectric modules to be as small as feasible. K should be very small or should be insulative to obtain a very high performance. On the other hand, you see that alpha should also be high. And resistance should be small as well. So you need a material where the electrical resistance should be as small as feasible and thermal resistance should be as small as feasible. Okay, so that's the maximum. This is the maximum, absolute maximum heat transfer rate that can be obtained for the given situation. And that is given by IMAX. So for us, uh, when you're trying to cool our heat, we are always interested in energy efficiency, how energy efficient it is. So before that, I forgot to mention one more thing. So the other extreme side is that what is the maximum temperature difference can one obtain? That is, I may be interested in finding out what is the lowest temperature my thermoelectric module will provide. That can be obtained when you set this QC to zero. If you set this to zero, then you'll find that this expression is equal to K times delta. And that gives you that delta T max that is dictated by alpha square T C square by 2 KR. And this alpha square divided by KR is often referred as the figure of merit of a thermoelectric model. And this Z always shows up even for power generation, heating, cooling, whatever it is, energy efficiency. This combination of terms always shows up. And if you increase this term, we always find that thermoelectric modules are energy efficient, they have higher power generation, they cool better. So that is why it is called a figure of merit for thermoelectric modules and it is alpha square, which is alpha is the Seebeck effect, K is the thermal conductance and R is the electrical resistance. So then moving on, this one other thing is if I, instead of writing it in this form, where there is area and uh, length involved in K and R because of non-dimensional parameter as I've discussed here. If I write it in terms of electrical intrinsic properties like this, alpha square is also intrinsic property of a material. K is also intrinsic property of a material. Rho is also an intrinsic property of a material. It also gives us how to pick a material. However, this is one of the most challenging aspects of this uh, is that now you want a material. Um, this is Wiedemann's Franz law. So that's why metals are not a good candidate. Initially, people were up there trying to do thermoelectric modules based on metals. However, 
Friedman Franz law tells us that if you decrease one, the other one decreases as well. So there is an issue with it that you can't, and it also affects alpha. So overall, in a metal, you can't improve figure of merit. So that's why semiconductors became popular, and and it is uh, it gives a flavor for um, how to improve uh, overall performance. Anyway. The quantity of interest, there are some discussions here. I'll leave it for you to read it later if you are interested. The, there's the quantity of other quantity of interest is the energy efficiency, which is the, often defined as the coefficient of performance, which is, you know, if you're trying to operate it in a refrigerator or cooler mode, is the rate of heat absorbed at the controlled side to the work done on the thermometer, the amount of work done. The amount of work done is nothing but the heat transfer rate QU minus Q sub C. That is the work done into the system. And QC is the heat transfer rate of the control side. That we can write it. And <clears throat> finally, you can write the beta. This is the coefficient of uh, expression, coefficient of performance for the thermoelectric module is given by this expression. Similar to um, Carnot cycle, one can write an expression based on the control side and uncontrol side, the coefficient of performance, which is Tc by Tu minus Tc. So one can find out that only when the figure of merit, this z, when it tends to infinity, from this expression, you will get this expression. Only when the figure of merit goes to, you can show it. I'm it's not shown here, but this expression can be managed. We collect all z into one term, and when you set z equal to infinity, that is when you will obtain the Carnot efficiency. That means the figure of merits of these pellet, pellets should approach infinity. So these thermoelectric modules will never get closer to. Um, the partner efficiency and the current day modules that are commercially available in the market are almost one fifth or one fourth of the uh, thermoelectric um, uh, partner efficient thermoelectric module COP is one fifth or one fourth and probably there are research devices that even get much uh, higher uh, coefficient of performance. However, they tend to be commercial modules tend to be in that one fifth or one fourth of the uh, for not efficiency, for not zero. So, if you, until now we talked only about uh, the energy balance for uh, one pellet, but if there are n number, oh, sorry, one thermocouple, if there are n number, then you multiply that by, uh, by that factor of n because everything, the heat conduction is in parallel and the electrical connection is in so then you obtain the same type of expression and you can plot uh, these things. This is the temperature distribution in the module. There are a lot of debates. Many people say that, uh, you know, ohmic heat is the I square R losses. Half of it goes to the control side and half of it goes to the uncontrolled side. But that type of uh, very loose arguments are incorrect and you will find that only under certain conditions, half of the heat goes to the control side and half of the heat goes to the control side. So uh, I that I'll stop uh, discussing the analysis any further, but we'll discuss one of the examples from Mark Hodes, which is on precision temperature control of an optical router. So what is an optical router is, I have put that on the screen here. Um, the reconfigurable optical add drop modules and they are um, you know analog devices that route light containing information in two optical fibers and these optical fibers they are they all expected to have a very precision temperature uh, they need to be maintained within a certain temperature range that is plus or minus one degree c here you exceed it, then uh, the information gets disrupted and it uh, gets actually corrupted. So 
the whole aim of this is that is to maintain the temperature of these modules and they are often referred as RODAM, reconfigurable optical add drop modules. And thermoelectric module, we'll discuss that as a way of controlling them. So the problem of interest here is to, let me move this here, to maintain a device that is placed here on the top at some temperature, 65 degrees, uh, sorry, 75 degrees. However, the ambient temperature where the uh, uncontrolled side sees a heat sink, the ampere temperature varies from minus 5 degrees Celsius to 65 degrees Celsius. Positive, negative 5 degrees to all the way to positive 5 degrees, 65 degrees. So now one has to design, how do I design a thermoelectric module to handle such a uh, large variation in ambient temperature and then also still meet the criteria of 75 degrees at the device. No matter what, whether it is minus 5 degrees or 65 degrees, the thermoelectric module should maintain the temperature of the device at 75 degrees. That is the goal. And uh, we make certain assumptions, and this is the statement of the, there is some epoxy here that attaches the device to the thermoelectric module, and then there is it seems and that is attached to the thermoelectric module using some grease, thermal interface. <clears throat> so we discussed this. Um, what we need to find out is that this device needs to be at 75. We don't know what this temperature at this interface where Peltier effect is happening. That is the uncontrolled, uh, that is the control side temperature, and this is the uncontrolled side temperature. If you really look at the unknowns in the problem, we don't know the control side temperature, that is TC. And we don't know the current that needs to be passed through this. And we don't know the heating resistance because, um, and then the work input also is unknown. These are the four unknowns, so you need four equations, and they are given by these four equations. Uh, if you do proper energy balance, we'll get this. And the power dissipated by that RODAM module is 10 watts. That is given in the problem statement itself. So I won't go, to it and go through each step, but instead I want to discuss the solution. This was obtained by numerically solving the four equations that are discussed here. These four equations appear from one from the energy balance at the uh, side where the control side or the device side. The second one is you take that energy balance and then this is the control side interface uh, balance, then the uncontrolled side and the total work input into the system. So these are the four equations that are there and four, four unknowns and four equations and you can solve it numerically. And let's look at, this is the plot shows heat sink resistance. And the vertical axis shows the power input into the thermoelectric module. The aim is to maintain that temperature and also minimize the work input into the system. If you really look at, there are two curves. One is the heating mode. When the um, ambient is at minus five degrees Celsius, we expect that the thermoelectric module will be in a heating mode such that the control side heats the component, electrical component, uh, the RODAM module to maintain its temperature at 75 degrees. The other is the cooling, uh, cooling mode where when the ambient is at 65 degrees Celsius, which is very high temperature uh, ambient, in that situation, the RODAM module needs to be operating in the cooling mode such that the control side temperature or the, uh, the component is maintained at 65 degrees Celsius. Let's look at the cooling mode. As you would expect, as you improve the heat sink resistance, the cooling gets better and better. Essentially, the power consumed also drops with it. Lower the resistance, lower the power input. 
because you you have a very effective heat sink. On the other hand, what happens is the heating mode. When you have very effective heat sink, then the resistance offered by the heat sink is small. That means the power input for heating actually goes up. Can can you say why? Because uh, what is resistance of a heat sink? It's delta temperature across that heat sink. That is base of that heat sink minus the ambient temperature divided, the, divided by the power. The power is fixed as 10 watts. If you make a heat sink very effective, that means the temperature difference is small. That means uh, if the ambient is at 65 degrees, it will only be 67 degrees at the base because my heat sink resistance is. If you use the same heat sink for heating, you'll run into the same issue. That is, if my ambient is minus 5, it will only be minus 7 or minus 8. That means I have to heat the thermoelectric module. The power that needs to be input into the thermoelectric module for heating is quite high to compensate for very effective heat sink. So that's why the heat sink for heating mode needs to be as poor as possible, while for the cooling mode, it needs to be as, as effective as possible. Where they cross, which is about 1.5 degrees Celsius per watt, is the optimum resistance that needs to be maintained so that the power consumed by the power thermoelectric module is not high. In this case, it comes out to be close to three. So that's the example of a thermoelectric module used for precision temperature control. People have exposed this for thermo, explored this for thermoelectric module for cooling of electronics itself. And then uh, during that 2004 period, uh, when the hotspots, when there was a single core architecture, where the device level hotspots were very, very high, um, what they've thought of doing and they demonstrated was that when they put a thermoelectric module on top of that very small small scale thermoelectric module on top of that hotspot that was sufficient to keep the control the temperature of the hotspot to to reasonable levels so whenever the hotspot uh, issue arises thermoelectric modules is one of the potential solutions people consider so with that i will stop this discussion on thermoelectric modules and uh, is there any question I'll on this? No, sir. Okay. I'll uh, I'll move to very briefly about micro channels, and um, because whatever I've discussed about uh, heat sinks is equally valid for micro channels as well, um, because uh, micro channels are also as long as you are talking about liquid flow through microchannels, they are all in the continuum regime. And there is no special treatment that is needed. So whatever I discussed on electronics, uh, heat sink, air cold heat sink, is equally valid for uh, microchannels as well. So when you talk about microchannels, it, it really we talk about from the perspective of liquid cooling of these um, system or liquid cooling of electronics. Here's an example on the left hand side where the electronics is cooled by a so-called cold plate, where there is liquid coming into that cold plate and picking up the heat and leaving that cold plate, and it goes to a radiator where it is dissipated off. Um, this coal plate, now in, internal structure of this coal plate has so-called micro channels. Micro channels are nothing but channels, uh, depending on who you talk to, uh, the feature sizes can be less than one millimeter, minimum feature size. Um, it's very loose terminology used by people. And then there are others that when you talk about liquid cooling, who think about 
taking the electronics and dumping it inside uh, from dielectric liquid itself. That is what is shown on the right hand side, which is the dielectric liquid cooled gray supercomputer from 1985. It's called immersion cooling. So, liquid cooling um, in general can be classified as indirect, direct. Indirect is when a cold plate, like what is shown here, um, is in contact with electrical source indirectly. Direct is where the electronics is directly in contact with the liquid. And then you can have single phase or two phase, even for indirect cooling or for direct cooling. Yes. There are many mechanisms we discussed about some of these. We also talked about initially about this so called uh, thermal conduction module. So, even back in the uh, 1965 or so, IBM has used water cooling for its uh, uh, mainframe computers. Um, however, you know, you can see this uh, back in 1965, this plot shows that in 65, they started doing water cooling. And this is IBM mainframe computers. And you can see that it was there until the invent of uh, advent of CMOS transistor. This was bipolar transistors. Um, these are current control transistors. CMOS is the voltage control. Once CMOS came into the picture now, uh, the water cooling dropped off and air cooling became predominant. And there, now this is very older slide. So now again, liquid cooling is showing up for CMOS because now CMOS uh, minimum feature sizes are so small that now there's a lot of leakage going and all those issues. Uh, so water cooling has already showed up for this CMOS technology as well. And as you can see, here is a supercomputer, uh, Power 775 supercomputer. This, uh, it is a massive, massive uh, supercomputer. It, uh, it weighs 6,000 pounds. One full rack weighs 6,000 pounds. It's extremely heavy and it is all liquid cooled system. And uh, this video is, I've kept the link. Um, if you're interested, you can have a look. Uh, this is, this looks like a small server box, but it is actually quite long. You need two people to um, pick this up. That is how long this is. Um, so it is about four feet or something like that. Four feet or six feet, I don't recall all the exact dim uh, dimension stuff. Um, However, those are the liquid cooled computers, and I already when I when I discussed about uh, heat pipes, uh, heat pipe is sort of like a liquid cooling for smartphones as well, and that is also sort of now becoming important. The loop heat pipes. So jumping straight into microchannels, next is what are microchannels? It may be defined as channels in the micrometer range, which is one micron to one millimeter, which is thousand microns, and or there are other meso channels, this channel, that channel. So I don't want to get into those arguments. And uh, people have come up with all sorts of definitions of these micro channels. This is a coal plate that is supplied by one of the suppliers called Cool Cool IT, and they have a very very high, highly dense micro channels. These are Again, so-called fin-fin microchannels. This is, was one of uh, my prior work where we used these uh, cold plates to cool the Xeon Phi cards. So what are microchannels? Why, why are they um, so much discussed about? The idea here is that uh, length scale is so small and a very simple example uh, will be able to explain why um, it is uh, interesting. A very simple example would be like for a Nusel number for fully developed flow, let's assume it is 4.8. Nusel number is the non dimensional heat transfer coefficient. If it is 4.8, um, then if I want to calculate its heat transfer coefficient, then I can calculate it by using a standard uh, Nusel number definition that is equal to if my hydraulic diameter is 100 microns it is 2880 however 
if my <coughs> micro channel instead of a micro channel i use a large size channel let's say this uh, hydraulic diameter is uh, 2 mm or uh, let's call it even 1 mm then it becomes automatically 288 that is 10 times smaller so that makes it uh, an interesting way of doing things is to make the channel smaller and make n number of them that is the idea in a macro channel is that instead of using one channel you increase the number of channels so that surface area is increased uh, not just the heat transfer coefficient you increase the surface area and also the problem associated with micro channels is that the pressure drop will also be high pressure drop meaning that the loss due to a flow going through two sur between surfaces because the fluid is always in friction is in a frictional contact with the surface so that means there is some amount of loss the fluid uh, experiences that is often measured in terms of its pressure uh, so that fluid pressure drop will be higher as well because these are smaller channels so you again control them by making these channels parallel when you make them parallel channels parallel then the overall pressure drop is same as a single channel itself because now you have divided the flow into n number of channels so what really happened was it's actually uh, interesting the history and uh, this was um these micro channels were uh, discussed as a possible option for cooling these mainframe computers and others uh, when uh, bipolar uh, junction trans transistors came about where they were they were looking as if very very high power requirements that uh, for delivering performance so they started to look into ways in 1981 this paper was published in 1981 by tuckerman and peace these people are electric electrical engineers they said they will etch the back side of the silicon and create channels and pump flow through it to cool them and they saw that it gave extremely good results and then it became a big success and uh, then all sorts of bizarre things started to happen when people started to measure the pressure drop which is often quantified in terms of frictional factor it was going all over the dimension uh, anywhere this is reynolds number on the horizontal which is velocity this is the non dimensional part of frictional factor times re which is the pressure drop part and so people are getting all sorts of bizarre things and they said there were discussions that uh, it is non continuum the flow because the channel sizes are so small that now the non continuum behavior because most of the conventional heat transfer or fluid flow equations we are talk about con conventional uh, uh, continuum behavior of these laws So the continuum loss breakdown is what the first conclusion that came out of all these things. But but it was not clear to people why continuum will break down because there are you know one can do some what is called scaling analysis and find out whether certain forces are expected to be dominant. And that's what I'll discuss briefly now um, <clears throat> for the time that. we are left um then they also noticed that there was you know uh, the transition from a laminar type of flow to a turbulent type of flow also occurred at very different um, situations or um which were i shouldn't say situations that they said the transition to turbulent also changed for this micro channel so the heat transfer was also not left out it also saw all sorts of bizarre you know quite a few changes every researcher reported all sorts of new results and you find that now the situation is more confusing than what it started with actually the electrical engineers showed that it can be done but then this all these others started to butcher it so you can do uh, you know uh, very if you look at the flow physics and say um what could be happening there are only two possibilities when someone says whether the 
flow is going to be in the continuum regime or uh, non-continuum regime, you find that rarefaction effects, that is the non-continuum regime, happens and it is dictated by what is called a Knudsen number, which is nothing but mean free path of the molecules divided by characteristic dimension. For a continuum flow where the continuum laws are to be valid, the Knudsen number, if calculated, should be less than 10 power minus 3. If it is between 10 power minus 2 to 10 power minus 1, it becomes slip flow. And you can see that if it is uh, greater than 10, then it is free molecular flow and so on. If you look at Knudsen number and you assume that the hydraulic diameter of a microchannel is 10 microns, then its pressure is one atmosphere. The Knudsen number calculated is 0 0.007 for air. And Knudsen number is much less than 10 power 7 for water. So non-continuum argument is not at all acceptable for microchannel dimensions that are greater than 10 microns, PDN, for water. The second is variation in dominant forces or dominant factors. These are the possible regions that could be dictating why this type of behavior is happening. If you look at dominant, what, what do I mean by variation in dominant forces or factors is that where the surface tension effects becoming fire, where if there are other forces, electromagnetic force, this force, that force. So if you go calculate all the forces that can occur and you find that the forces that actually matter are the viscous forces and the surface forces. The rest of the other things show up at length scales that are much, much, much smaller than what we targeted. So it became clear that one has to carefully capture surface tension effects if, if, if it needs to be captured, and the viscous forces, which is viscosity, the skin frictional loss. Those are the two primary forces. Otherwise, the forces are not changing in microchannels, nor are the continuum effects, if, as long as we are talking about water. Air may be it is getting closer to the continuum regime, which is, uh, but it's still higher than this 10 power minus 3 number. However, uh, water is all that is discussed here for microchannel purposes. So with that, you find that the last possible option is compressibility, whether the flow needs to be treated as compressible flow or incompressible. In heat transfer, most of the flows are treated as if they are incompressible for these cooling purposes. So one can even look at Mach numbers and stuff and Eckert number. You find that many of these uh, arguments show up uh, really not in great uh, degree of importance. So what could be the result for all those variation in friction factor? It turns out that bad experiments. People were in a hurry to publish papers or whatever it is. So they were in a hurry to publish and they saw bad data, but they didn't really carefully look at it. And uh, so the, the, then as there were many groups who carefully performed experiments and uh, showed that conventional laws that are used, conventional correlations that are used for macro scale channels are equally valid for micro channels as well. And the transition, uh, one always talks about transition to turbulence in uh, conventional channels to be on the order of um, 2,300, 2,000. So here also it transitions at the same range. So um, this sort of behavior is also happening in the nanofluids world as well these days. I thought uh, it is best to bring this up. Otherwise, all the topics that I covered, all the uh, um, discussions I had for heat uh, um, are equally valid for modeling um, uh, microchannels as well. And a microchannel resistance typically should be captured as 1 by m dot c p times the effectiveness. The same expression that I had discussed based on heat exchanger theory for heat sinks, the same should be used. What are the changes in? Heat transfer in single phase microchannels is that 
uh, most of the flow tends to be slightly on the simultaneously developing region or developing region, family developing region. Otherwise, all the conventional correlations were equally valid. So with that, I will just stop on, this was a shorter discussion I wanted to have on Matrachan because otherwise it's a repeat of what I've already discussed in the past. So today and tomorrow, for whatever time remaining, for another um, um, 15 minutes, um, I'll start. Yeah, please. Is there a question? No, sir. No, sir. Okay. Um, so tomorrow and today, I'll uh, what I'll focus on, I'll discuss a little bit about data centers. Um, for the uh, remaining lectures and finally talk about photo electro thermal theory uh, for LEDs as an example of what really how how to look at all the aspects essentially not only one has to worry about thermal part but also the electrical part or the combined part should be just for designing these things so as an example I'll just talk about the photo electro thermal theory uh, for LEDs because they are uh, sort of um, unique where you have to worry about lumens and also the electrical part of it where there is a temperature dependent component. So first I'll cover the data centers and um, and there is a tomorrow I'll try to do a air cool data center model a simple model how to capture from all the way from cooling tower to the chip side uh, from a data center. So this I discussed in my first lecture that data centers are expected to um, you know, consume a lot more energy in the coming decades. And uh, of course, all the current big um, revenue companies from market capitalization are all information technology or digital technology companies. And just to recap quickly, what makes the building blocks of a data center is that you have a transistor that is packed into a die and the die is mounted, um, is connected to the external world through a package. From the package to a board, a board and N number of boards make a chassis. And the chassis each you make n number of chassis into a into a box that is a rack and usually the racks are of standard height which is 42 42 u u is 1.75 inches this is a world war ii standard for ensuring that uh, these racks can enter any standard building because all those doors are standard sizes you design uh, non-standard sizes then some of these racks cannot even enter a building even though uh, they may be bought but uh, they can't even enter a building so the racks are typically 42 u u is 1.75 inches and then the n number of racks makes a data center as we discussed previously power density is high uh, heat flux is high at the package level and at the die level the power dissipated is quite high at the data center level. So that makes it extremely challenging. And we discussed about the heat flux challenge previously. The hot spots in a heat flux uh, in a power amplifier or a logic chip can be very, very high on the order of um, you know, thousands of watts, kilowatts, or thousands of watts per centimeter square. This is equivalent to being on the sun surface, but at a lower temperature. So one has to maintain a lower temperature and also dissipate that high heat flux. And that makes the heat flux challenge. And the power challenge is such that, you know, um, these uh, supercomputers are aiming to obtain what are called the exaflops. Flop is the floating point operations per second. So with that, currently the Fugaku, which is a recent supercomputer um, that emerged as, it dissipates 28.3 megawatts. Uh, this is in megawatts, 
at 28.3 megawatts to deliver 415 petaflops. So um, an exaflop will be 1,000 petaflops. And uh, so the ex projected power for delivering that exaflop will be close to 40 megawatts. Uh, so that means it's extremely, for a supercomputer, that's a lot of power. So but the point is that amount of power needs to be removed and dumped in the, into the atmosphere. So data centers uh, are classified in many ways. And um, as we discussed previously, all the power that was dumped into a data center shows up as heat at some point at some, in, in, some, in some place, either you know, at the power plant level or at the cooling system level or within the data center room itself. And if it is an air-cooled data center, the cooling and the provision provided power provision provider itself consumes 43% of the total power that is input into the data. And the compute, which is the server box, and the memory and the CPU and others, they consume 43%. So equal amount of power goes to the cooling and power distribution units and so on as the compute itself. That means the power consumed should be reduced by this electrical or oh, sorry, these cooling equipment. That is one of the big challenges in data centers. And in data centers, uh, this is an example of a air cooled data center that we briefly discussed in the first class, but I have to repeat here. Is that this is a building where it houses all the computer racks and uh, Hello? Screen is not visible to me, sir. Have you shared something? Oh, it's not visible? Okay, sorry. Maybe I didn't share. It's not visible. Sir, also, I, I got a small question. I don't know if it is uh, too silly, but uh, you're saying there's a lot of. Yeah, now it is visible, sir. Ah. Yeah, you were mentioning that there is so much power which will be converted into heat from uh, even a single rack. So I was just wondering, is it. Uh, possible to put a thermocouple and then try to convert some some of that into useful power by any chance? Uh, so the question is, it's not silly. People have attempted it, but the conversion of these modules are very poor. Currently, these thermoelectric modules, uh, commercially available ones, um, convert up to five percent, five to six percent for very large temperature difference. So that means uh, if you really look at these, one of the biggest problem in uh, converting the thermal energy into power, uh, the real problem is the temperature is low. Um, if I'm coming in at 50 degrees Celsius, I will be exiting at 70 degrees Celsius. That is, if I'm flowing air or any, it doesn't matter what fluid it is, I'm picking up heat from a device. It will typically, the temperature, overall temperature rise of that fluid will be only about 10 to 20 degrees. Let's assume 20 degrees. So 70 degrees Celsius is the maximum temperature. And let's say the ambient is even 30 degrees. So that means you have 40 degree temperature difference within which you are supposed to derive power. If you use these thermoelectric modules, the best case scenario for 100 degree temperature drop is only 5% conversion. That is if I dissipate 100 watts, then I will get five watts out of it. If I have 100 degrees Celsius, Okay, let's let's worry. Let's not uh, um, let us not worry about uh, uh, 100 degrees Celsius and say that it has conversion efficiency of five watts. That means from 100 watts, I am able to get five watts, but the cost of these modules are ridiculously high. It is about twelve dollars per watt. That means for five watts, I'm spending so much money to capture that five watts. 
um, that it becomes from a practical sense in peaceful. People have shown that you know um, what they what they have done is they have put a thermal shunt at the backside of the heat source and moved that heat to because you have to still remove the heat out of that place to keep the the package at a certain temperature. So they put a thermal uh, shunt to move the heat to a certain place where they can uh, recover some power, uh, electrical power, and it just turns a fan. That's that's about. It. And however, that fan is not um, continuously running because the power dissipated by the device itself is not at a constant. Um, it's not dissipating always the same power all the time. So it is varying so much. So from an overall perspective, uh, I can't expect the same 20 degree or 30 degree delta all the time. So converting that heat, because it's a very low grade heat, to power becomes, uh, um, from a capital perspective, not so economical. Got it, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry, I I think I I spoke about these slides. I'll quickly scan through them um, because I didn't share it. So this, you know, there have been some alarming numbers people have projected, saying, "Oh, it's going to the data centers are going to consume about um, 416 terawatt hours." and uh, so on and so forth um this is uh, uh this is like um big numbers people have projected and uh, however the real trends show that it is only about 200 terawatt hours and not so much so ne nevertheless the power dissipated by these data centers are growing at a rapid rate but the energy efficiency of these electronics is also improving at a rapid rate. Uh, is also improving from many different perspectives. So energy efficiency is improving while the number of data centers are also increasing. But the overall increase in the data center power consumption is not uh, like some simple math people have put together. However, it is still rising, but not at the rate of three times, four times this, that number it is more like a 8%, 10% range. So for a data center, there is a transistor built into a die, and then we talked about package, package to boards, boards to chassis, chassis to rack, and to a data center. And uh, we said, uh, we talked about this as well in the first lecture, that Heat flux can be very, very high for the hot spots close to the sun surface, but at a lower temperature, because you have to maintain these at a lower temperature. And uh, the power, on the other hand, is growing at the data center level for a supercomputer. These, all these are supercomputers that is shown here for uh, top supercomputer. Uh, that is, every six months, the supercomputers in the world are ranked based on their performance. And if you see the the real uh, race is towards achieving what is called exaflop, and the 2020 supercomputer Fugaku consumes 28.3 megawatts, deliver 415 petaflops, and uh, it is expected in 2021 or 2022 an exaflop machine will show up, and the projected power is 40 megawatts. There is a lot of power being dumped into the atmosphere, uh, and uh, because whatever the power that is put into the data center, all of them, almost all of them, shows up as um, heat. So all the heat needs to be removed out of the data center so that uh, one can operate uh, and also the devices can be reliable and serve the life of its. Um, so power consumed, by the cooling equipment is almost equal to the power consumed by the computing equipment, which is uh, which makes it uh, 
equally important to address the energy efficiency of, of the cooling equipment as well. And, uh, you know, so this is where I stopped uh, and you pointed out that I wasn't sharing. So anyway, this is uh, an air cool data center. And I will stop today at this point. Um, this is a building hall, typically where uh, computer racks, these greens are computer racks that are, and uh, they're housed. And this gray area is where, is what is called a perforated tile. Old air is usually pushed through that perforated tile. They enter the green racks where there are fans that pull these cold air through and dissipate. There are heat sinks in there and they dissipate heat into the cold air and that gets out as hot air. And the hot air enters this blue box. There are three of them shown here. They are the so-called crack units, computer room, air control, uh, air conditioning, um, where it has a liquid to air heat exchanger. The air is the hot air that goes through and the liquid is the liquid coming from the chiller. So the liquid comes from the chiller go through the pump and enters this crack units where it exchanges heat with the hot air. And the hot air transfers heat to the cold liquid water, ethylene block, blackout water or whatever it is. And that hot water then goes back to the chiller and gets cooled uh, and returns back to heating up heat. Another side of the Chiller, which is the condenser, this is the evaporator side of the chiller and this is the condenser side of the chiller. The hot condenser fluid goes to a cooling tower or a dry cooler, whichever is there. here it is shown as cooling tower. The hot water is sprayed and ambient air is blown through it and it cools the water and the cooled water enters the condenser inlet of the chiller. That's the overall loop of a data center uh, for an air cooled equipment. That is the simplified view of it. So we'll discuss, um, we'll do a very simple model in the tomorrow and, uh, and also talk about uh, LEDs from a thermal perspective. Also. Any questions? I'll stop here. No, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. And I will upload tonight. I've put all the recorded videos now on that link that yes. I have shared. Right, sir. Right. I'll put the PFs as well tonight. Yes, sir. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you.